Um, as always, feel free to connect with us. Um, I hear my dog in the background. Uh, on our meetup page where we're posting all of our up and coming meetings. Um, our YouTube's where recordings of these, if you ever want to circle back or check something out again or share it with a friend. Um, feel free to reach out to any one of us if you have any questions, comments, concerns, um, like to see any topics, anything like that. We also have a Slack that you can join. Um, our schedule today will be over Microsoft Identity um, by Javier Lozano. And then next, our next meeting on the 1st will be over Teams Plugin. Um, and then the 15th will be a machine learning talk. Um, and as always, there's some free resources out there for you to learn more. And feel free to join our Slack. And I will pass it off to Javier. Sweet. Thank you so much. Let me acknowledge that this meeting is being recorded because team won't let me do anything else until I do. <laughs> so let me share my content here for you. Can you all see my... Um, my uh, VS Code? Yep. Sweet, awesome. Well, everybody, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, we were starting a little bit late. Uh, I have a couple demos that I wanna talk about. However, it's really not about the demos. It's about having you get an understanding of what Microsoft Identity is, uh, how you can use it in your applications, whether it be desktop or um, web or APIs, and kind of what things you can get pretty easily out of the box when you when you configure, uh, we can, when you configure the right settings, twist the right knobs, twist the right uh, um, wires, and so on. So, anyway, uh, like um, like I said, my name is Javier Lozano. Uh, here's my information. There's my Twitter handle. There's my email. I I f fellow um, .NET user group leader. I founded the Iowa .NET user group. I'm sure you, some some of you know me here from in town. I'm also running a small consulting company consulting company called Lozano Tech. Uh, I've been doing that for the past uh, 12 years now. So that's that's been fun. Uh, I, I'm an MVP, Microsoft Mobile Group Professional, focusing on quote unquote developer technologies, mostly ASP.NET and um, Azure from a development perspective. Uh, as in like, how do I take my applications, my systems and deploy them out there and, and build applications on the cloud. Uh, also, I am a board member of the .NET Foundation. The .NET Foundation is um, the, uh, the, I would say the overarching organization where everything that is .NET related, open source projects such as .NET uh, res <laughs> resides under, uh, all the copyrights uh, and um, licenses and everything are part of the .NET Foundation and keeping that arm length away from Microsoft. You know, it's just people want to have that separation. It's it's great. We're, we're fighting the good fight, su supporting our, our open source com uh, open source community. And and hopefully, uh, if you're not a member, you can go uh, to .NET Foundation org and go join. All right, that's it for this. Uh, if you got any questions, please interrupt me. Uh, I'm literally all the thing I'm seeing is my camera right here and my mic and my screen. Uh, and um, Alex just he shut off his camera, so I only see an A. So if if you want to ask a question, go ahead and show your camera so I can talk to you and feels like I'm talking to a human being. All right. So, but beyond that, let me start something with something very quick. Uh, how many of you are familiar with this website? Have I been pawned.com? So haveibeenpawned.com is a website that is created by a another fellow MVP and uh, regional director or RD, um, Troy Hunt. He's out of Queensland, Australia. So he's a very smart guy, uh, super into security breaches and you know, essentially, hey, here's how you set up a honeypot, here's how you do this and so forth. And one of the things that he did, he actually set up this, this website, said haveibeenpawned.com to actually see whether your email or whatever other sense of data has been pawned. As in like, hey, someone put this out in a S3 bucket that is completely unsecure and it's all your personal information, all your passwords. So that way if there's a password breach, you get all the spam saying, hey, you know, please send um, Bitcoin to blah, 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 blah. Right, so this website allows you to check your email or your phone number and to say, yep, you've been part of X many breaches, which is pretty neat. So uh, it could also be very scary. So if you have a, if you are reusing passwords, 
uh, across multiple websites. I recommend you check it here and figure out if those websites that uh, you are using these passwords as have been breached. Always use multi-factor authentication, MFA, so on and so on and so on. So anyway, the reason why I'm showing you this is not because of like trying to scare you or anything else, but because authentication, identity, authorization, all these things are hard, are very, very hard. Now you can do your own. I've been doing as a as a passion or serendipitous or uh, I was going to say alliance to some of my clients, or I literally just drew the short straw. I've been doing identity for the past four to five years. Now, I say that four to five years because of it's been a different flavor because the word identity means different things to different people. Okay. So why do I talk about identity? Is because of this. Is because down here we have eleven. Uh, that's a billion. Eleven billion two hundred fifty-eight. Uh, million three hundred seventy six thousand three hundred forty four accounts that have been unique accounts nonetheless that have been actually compromised and you can tell here's all the different breaches all the data blah 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 fun and scary look at that over a half a billion Facebook accounts sweet anyway so the reason why I say that is because if you are currently hosting username and passwords and you have to do MFA in, in um, encryption and resets and everything else that is a lot of work that you should at least have one team solely working on that internally because that team is going to be very busy because they have to get ahead of all the different things that are out there to prevent breaches such as of the one I'm discussing too or you can use something else that's something else and, and by no means I'm saying if you're doing it internally you're doing it wrong I am just saying is if you do it internally you're going to be very busy very, very busy just doing that uh, outside of um, all the other features or whatever things you're going to be developing for your clients. So uh, anyway, so one of the one of the terms that I've been coining lately uh, because it's we're in a new dawn of about say cloud 2.0 or 1.5 or 3.0. I forgot the number. Um, it's not really about Docker. It's not really about containerization. None, none of those things. Those the problem has been solved and it's been there. It's really about identity as a service. Well, what does that mean? It means having third party services. So this is Azure AD, uh, Auth0, Okta, Azure B2C, um, Ping Identity, right? Um, heck, even Salesforce you know, uh, is out there, Google, all these different things that are essentially identity providers. As in like, they store accounts, they validate credentials, they they're the ones that you can integrate with and say, hey, I want to be able to easily turn a key and be able to authenticate my users against something, right? How many of us have gone to a website where it's like logged in with LinkedIn, logged in with Google, logged in with Microsoft account? All of those different things are identity providers. So what does that mean? It means that you as a system, if depending at to what level of integration we go to, you don't have to actually integrate with that system so, so, sorry, you don't have to actually store those passwords. You can say, "Hey, I only gonna I'm gonna register um, the myself with an identity provider, an IDP, and that essentially is gonna say I have my application X. My application X is um, a client of that identity provider. There's a mutual trust. There's uh, tokens and exchanges that happen between your application, a client, and the uh, IDP." where it says, okay, well, Javier logged in with his Gmail and I know who that is. He has multi-factor authentication. He went through the whole rigmarole. Perfect, Javier, go ahead and pass go and collect $200. Because what we're going to authenticate is so good. After your authentication happens, all those claims, all that information about me can send back to the application and then the application can then set up a security context, a cookie or a database table or a database row or whatever you're going to be doing, right? So that is the gist of this presentation. It's kind of show what is possible out there from a desktop API and uh, web application using Microsoft Azure AD. Now, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Azure AD has two flavors. They have one called Azure AD, which essentially encompasses all of your uh, your tenants. So you work for Acme uh, Acme Inc. So you have acme.onmicrosoft.com. That company 
um, has Active Directory, uh, Azure AD, which could be synced from on-prem, what, you know, whatever thing that you may have, um, those passwords are kept secure for uh, in Azure AD. Now, there are, the other flavor that I have that I mentioned about Azure AD is called Azure B2C, Business to Customer, which essentially is a way so you can say, hey, I have a, I have a soccer match app that I want people to log in. Well, I can create a um, an Azure B2C instance where I can have all of my users register into that directory. So when they click on login, they will be sent to Azure B2C. You can brand it, you can do whatever you want. They will authenticate, I can enforce MFA, whatever, and then it will come back to my app. The cool part about it is something like Azure B2C and even Azure is you have free unlimited users with Azure B2C. It is like literally 500,000 objects. So over a half, I mean, a half a million users, technically for free, for authentication and everything else. Anyway, enough about that. Let's talk about our applications. So I'm going to close have a big pond. I'm going to go over here. And one of the things that you can do here, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit, I have my Lozano Tech Active Directory because that's the only one that I use because there's really nothing there of secureness. I have applications that are hosted there, but they're mostly demos. So it's not like it's anything critical. Now, uh, and here I have different applications. As you can see, that I've created some today because uh, I was reconfiguring a couple things. So I have a uh, three applications that I'm going to be talking about. In particular, it's going to be UG Demo, which is a basic demo of how you can set up an ASP.NET Core application or .NET Framework. You know, uh, it's about the same um, same level of effort for regardless of the uh, or the of the application that you have. As, as well with something called uh, the 425 show API client and um, sorry API and 425 show client. Now the 425 show. So if I go look at 425 show, it is a show on Twitch, which you may have access to or not access to. I'm going to pause this. That is um, done by um, uh, if technical ev evangelists with uh, from Microsoft. So if I click on this guy, we in this, for example, they talk about using managed identity with your APIs, even from Logic Apps. So they literally, it's an hour and a half stream where my friends uh, uh, PJ and Christophs, I can find a picture, better picture of Christophs. We'll go right there. Yep, yeah. um, there is PJ and Christophs, where they go through and they set up everything from scratch for you and they step you through everything. So I was actually in their show a couple of weeks ago, uh, by, a couple of weeks ago, two months ago. And we went through kind of one of the demos that I have here, so I'm showing you that. So I rec highly recommend you spend the time and go check out those videos. Again, it's Twitch TV forward slash 425 show. So I make no money from it. I just like I like them. They're really nice guys. And literally, they work with the team that's building this stuff. So if you don't like it, you can say, why does this suck? And then they will take your feedback and actually act on it. So anyway. So let's talk about uh, application registration. So it, if you have access to this in whether it be a sandbox region or in your Azure account or whatever, you can go in here and manage users, manage groups, manage external identities as in like, hey, here's Google, here's Facebook, here's blah, whatever. You can do all these different things. Now, the most important for the, what I'm gonna be showing here is app registrations. App registrations is when you can actually come in here and say, hey, I am going to be creating applications that are specific to my um, to what I'm trying to do, and I'm going to be using this instance, this tenant of Azure AD, that is the Lozano Tech uh, a tenant ID for all my demos, right? So essentially, that's going to that's going to have my users, that's going to allow me to authenticate, that's going to allow me to do everything that I need to for it from whatever perspective. So. I went through and I created, I clicked on new registration, literally about 15 minutes before the presentation, uh, 20 minutes before the presentation, and started configuring things. I went and created this one called UG Demo. Now, in here, UG Demo, it allows me to configure, and I don't care if I know we're recording, it doesn't matter because I'm going to delete this account. So 
Haha, -ha, that's the beautiful thing about this is that these things can come and go as I please and literally over changing our GUIDs. So this is information once after I create the, re the app registration, I'm saying here's my client ID, here's my object ID. This is an object ID for all everybody who's familiar with, that, um, with Active Directory. That is literally the object GUID in Active Directory that is configured there. There is the tenant ID, which means this is the instance of that directory that is out there and says, hey, I'm supporting all Microsoft accounts users, which is essentially members of my tenant and members of uh, Microsoft accounts as well. So uh, from here, you get this kind of high level information and then you can come over and actually configure apps. So one of the things that when you hit, when you click and hit add platform, you can say this is a spa or single page application. This is a web app. This is an iOS, Mac OS application. This is an Android. Here's a mobile desktop application. What does that mean? That means that there are different types of applications which each follow different authentication flows. Uh, imagine uh, doing a dance, right? Where you're doing the Foxtrot, for example. When you're doing the Foxtrot, uh, you hope that your partner knows how to do the Foxtrot because if not, then it's going to get weird, right? Because you're sort of just kind of fumbling out there in the dance floor. And that's if you're into dancing. If you're not into dancing, that's that's perfectly fine as well. But these type of application, these authentication flows are like dances where both parties, both the IDP, which is Azure AD here, and your client application need to know how to communicate and how to exchange those claims. Otherwise, you're going to fumble and it, nothing's going to work. OK, so in here I went and created a web platform because essentially it's a web application. And one of the things you can see in here, and these are just kind of warnings, which again, they're just default values. I'm just saying, hey, my redirect URL is going to be 44360 localhost uh, slash signing ID. And this is all configurable by me on my code. So essentially what this is, hey, by the way, my application is here. I have that, uh, excuse me, this uh, application ID, which identifies it specifically. So there's my unique ID. By the way, after you're done authenticating and you're doing the, uh, after we're doing doing the Foxtrot, I want you to take me back to my seat and here's my URL for that seat. I'm done, right? And then down here, we can actually say, hey, by the way, I also want to get access tokens. I want to get ID tokens. I can cherry pick whatever I want and say, and these tokens have specific information or claims, right, about me as an, as an authenticated user. So this allows me to literally just sort of set it and forget it on the IDP, uh, that identity provider side, and my application certainly just flows very smoothly. So what does my application look like? Well, uh, let me know if the screen has refreshed. I know sometimes Teams is a little bit slow. Um, so what I did here uh, for the simplicity of time, I went to file new ASP and core web application, and I added several NuGet packages in here. If you're a .NET developer, or you're, or you're an IT admin, you've probably heard something called of NuGet, N-U-G-E-T, uh, which essentially it's like, um, it's a package manager, it's a package repository and a protocol per se, that allows you to say, hey, here's code that is signed and it's been deployed out there for you to do this work. Well, instead of you writing all this code and saying it's gonna take me three months just to come up with a login page, you can literally just say, hey, I need to add two packages in here. This is the simplest case scenario for an application. I want to use OpenID Connect, which is a type of protocol, which we can discuss a little bit here in a bit in a second. And I want cookies. So what does that mean? What do I care about cookies? Not only because they're delicious, but every type of authentication that happens on the web browser, cookies are everywhere, right? Cookies are the things that we that the web browser, I'm sorry, the web application drops into the browser to say, hey, here's metadata for this. It's encrypted, it's signed, whatever. And this is information that I care about for my um, for me to function the way I need to, right? You can put in authentication info, you can put in preferences, whatever you want, right? So in this situation, I'm using OpenID Connect as the protocol to interact with Azure AD, and I'm using cookies to take the values and the claims that I get from the protocol flow into my web application. So how does this all wire it up? Pretty straightforward. Um, this is a literally plain Jane application uh, where I have just a controller with a couple um, 
just actions underneath of it, just to kind of to show how the different things work. So uh, we care literally about lines 27 to line 51. So if I'm going to zoom in a little bit, so it's a little bit easier to see, and we'll cover it. Uh, I won't go line by line, but I'll go by chunk by chunk. So let's go 27 to 32 lines. Uh, sorry, line 27 to line 32. In here, essentially, I'm saying, hey, I want to add authentication to my application. That is just essentially saying I want to add it, and here's the configuration values on it. It doesn't mean it's actually enforcing it. Okay, that is just saying, hey, if someone cares about authentication, here's how you go about using it. Line 28, I say my default uh, authentication scheme, scheme as in like here's the way where the application is going to do some work behind the scenes is going to be cookies, right? And line 29, it says here's how you configure those settings for the cookies authentication scheme. So I just took something very simple and I just called the name of the cookie is going to be dot demo. That's it. So when we go look at the browser, we look at the cookies and we're going to we'll see a dot demo cookie. But it's going to be either chunked because it's too big, you know, over 4K or it's going to be under 4K or whatever. We'll look at that here in a second. That's literally what I'm saying. It's like, by the way, default settings used to everything here. Signing, blah, blah, blah. Assigning for encryption of cookies, all of that stuff is default out of the box. Now, lines 33 to 51. Uh, this is where I'm actually configuring Azure AD. All right. So in here, I'm telling it, hey, by the way, line 33 says the name of this authentication scheme is called Azure AD. I can call it kittens. I can call it foo. I can call it bar. It doesn't care. Right. It just needs to know what that value is. Ideally, you want to put this in a constant. If you just can use it around, if you want to, again, it's a demo. I just kind of went down this path. But this is going to come and be useful here in a little bit when I show you kind of those parts. Uh, lines 35 and 36, I'm essentially saying, hey, by the way, the authority, the IDP, the thing that knows about this open ID flow lives at this URL. At the URI, right? Login the Microsoft Online forward slash common. Now forward slash common that says, hey, uh, there's different settings which we'll talk about it here once we go into the other demo. But you know slash common slash consumer slash GUID. Those um, GUID act in actual natural GUID, and we'll talk about that what that means in a second. Uh, Thirty six is the client ID, literally that I copied and pasted from Azure over to here. Uh, sign in scheme, by the way, line thirty eight. Line 38 connects the code that was in line, um, excuse me, I couldn't scroll, line 28 and line 33 by saying, hey, by the way, after you phone home, after you saying, hey, you're fully authenticated and we need to store information, you're going to hand this over to this other scheme. So you're going to do your work, you're going to authenticate, you're going to do the dance and once that's done, you're going to take it over here, and this other thing is going to take over. Okay. And that authentication scheme is going to do whatever it needs to. And your job is done. Thank you very much, Azure AD. You've been, you've been really helpful. From here, line 40 and 41, I'm saying, hey, I care about an ID token, right? Which essentially is like, I don't care about any other information associated there. I just care about the ID token of that user that authenticated, right? There's some something else called an access token, which I'm sure you probably have heard about. If you're doing anything like OAuth or anything or, or API authentication, which essentially says here's the access, here's what this authenticated user has access to. Here are scopes, here's blah blah blah, uh, here's time signatures and everything. We'll cover that here in a second uh, in the next demos. The callback path. This is what I mentioned before in that when you add that redirect URL slash signing ID, and then here I'm just literally taking it up to a next level. I'm saying, hey, by the way. I want you to validate the token, and I want you to make sure that that token has a valid audience. That is that this token is literally intended for my ID. So that means that so I can't log in into Foo app that has a different token and send this across to this one because you're literally going to say eh, eh, eh. I don't care about the Foo app token. I care about my bar app token or whatever right and then name claim type and roles like make sure these that that these names sort of match you don't have to have any of that you can shut it off 
right? You see where it says validate issue equal false. I can say validate audience equal false if I wanted to as well. Anyway, any questions thus far? I'm kind of going about this a little bit all over the place. No? Sweet. Awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run it. I'm going to run this bad boy uh, and IS Express. I do have a quick question, Javier. Yes, sir. If you turn audience and issuer both to false, is that basically a way of saying if you have any Microsoft token, I'm okay with you hitting my stuff? Yes, essentially what it does. Okay. Now, and you kind of have to turn other things off as well because they don't want you to be like, okay, well, you signed, you signed your life away. Good luck, right? There's other specific sure. things. In other words, you can do that but it will take some work. And by some work, it's like you have to know the combination of what it is. Just because if you think about it, it could be a lawsuit waiting to happen. <laughs> right? right? It's like, well, well, I just pushed this button. It's like, yeah, but did you know what? why you were pushing the button? No. Right? <laughs> so, but yeah, but more traditionally than not, um, you don't want to shut that off. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, no problem. That's a great, that's a very great question, by the way. Thank you so much. So uh, what I'm going to do here, actually, I'm going to use this in incognito mode. Uh, I'm going to oh, put the wrong thing. Sorry. Uh, oh, come on. Oh, helps if I use the right keyword. I am on my Mac and I'm on Windows. So I'm trying to remember the key uh, keystrokes. And I literally just had the world's like biggest brain fart when it happened there. So my apologies for that. So in here, what I'm going to do is there's there's an endpoint called home, uh, there's an action called um, login under the home controller. So let's go look at like, let's go look at what that looks like quick. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna go to home controller, home controller, home controller, login. What I'm saying is in line four and descend and saying, hey, by the way, you, I want you to redirect to slash home slash diagnostics, which essentially is gonna echo what's in the cookie, okay, after authentication. However, I want to challenge you. Not like a challenge doesn't like do this, but in the web terms, when you say challenge, essentially it means authenticate, right? I want you to want you to provide claims. I want you to provide something. The challenge could be an SSL cert, could be basic authentication when the you know the little browser box comes up and you're typing username and your password. It could be a uh, OIDC flow, whatever those things are. And the um, the web application, your web application will then handle the right flows from that perspective. And here, as, as you saw in line, as you see in line 43, that is where that name comes from, Azure AD. Remember when we configured that authentication scheme? Those names have to match. If I put in kittens and I in here in line 43 and I leave that to Azure AD, it's going to blow up because there's no way they can actually say you have nothing configured. Would you please check it? And you'll get a very very generous and very descriptive error of what you did wrong, but at least this way you know that this uh, this name in line forty three needs to equate to the name in that uh, in the startup file. So uh, we'll come over here. I will hit login, and da da da. da I get prompted with my Microsoft login account OAuth authorized. There's the client ID. There's that GUID that was in there. I want you to come, there's that sign in ID. I can literally take that URL and split it apart. Do whatever I want with it to actually, to show you the values that are there. All right, <clears throat> so in here I'm gonna type in my, uh, so that's my, my Microsoft account. It's created by me. And it's gonna ask me for my credentials. Pretty cool, huh? So if, I'm kind of, if I come over here and I do the same thing, I'm already logged in. So uh, remain signed in with this account, sign out with a different account. Come on, this is the fun part of it. So I was trying not to do that. Uh, uh, let me say, cool, I'll paste that there. And I've authenticated. So notice that the URL has changed. I'm now back to my actual app, okay? If I were to sign in with the same uh, password over here, check it out. It's ask, asking me for an enter code. The reason why that is in the other browser, it was my my already existing browser. The cookie's already there. Azure AD or the flow already knows that I've already validated who I am. And here it's actually ask, asking for my, um, give me one second my Microsoft Authenticator code. 
So in here, I can actually type in nine four seven five eight seven nine eight verify five, and boom, I'm off to the races. Now I pre previously logged in, so you won't, you didn't see the prompt of saying, "Hey, are you sure you want to?" You know, uh, UG demo is asking for this type of information. Are you sure you want to give it to them? And then you say yes. That's the consent form. I already said yes to it, so I'm not getting prompted. Um, so it's one of those things. If I were to actually go to my accounts that Microsoft.com and actually look at my my uh, um, allowed allowed applications, I will see UG Demo listed there as one of those applications. So it's all encompassing, right? So you can actually see when you authenticate it. There's so many different things that are kind of nice from that perspective. So in here. Here's information about me. There's my name. Here's the authenticator. Here's my last name, surname, email address. Here's properties. Here's all this information that is already there and authenticated via Azure AD. That scheme, the authentication scheme that's there. And there, here's a, an iframe to check the session. And here's what I what I told it to come back and redirect, I guess. So and uh, the cookie, it will be valid for you know, about the next, what, two weeks, the authentication ticket, because that's the default. Now you can make that smaller and everything else. I just left it out of the box, essentially the way it's set up uh, for you to be able to have that. Any questions? No? Cool. Uh, I'm gonna close this. So now let's take it a little bit more than just like, hey, sweet, you know, here's a web app, whoop to do, whoop to do right? Uh, let's actually take it to a level where we actually need uh, an, an API, right? We all work in environments that actually have APIs <clears throat> that need a certain level of authentication, right? So one of the things that we that you can do, and this is actually using different NuGet packages. So the NuGet package that I showed before was literally choose your own adventure. You can configure, you can be very, very nitpicky on what that is. Uh, there's also another new NuGet package called Microsoft that identity. This is that that's, and now we come to the title of of the presentation. That web. Now this is literally all a huge wrapper around certain defaults that are well documented for essentially using uh, the Microsoft identity endpoints, Azure AD or Azure, or Azure B2C. Azure B2C. Uh, requires different configuration values, but it's literally the same package that all funnels together, right? The um, the the Microsoft Identity team, <clears throat> excuse me, has done this so that way just to make it simple. Just because again, authentication, authorization, all those things are hard. By going down this path, you can actually be able to have it more be uh, code configuration. Uh, sorry, um, settings configuration rather than code configuration. So what does that mean? It means that. It's literally an ASP.NET an application. The main difference is though, I have two controllers. I have a role controller, which is just an API controller, and I have an identity controller, which is an, another API controller. So in here, I'm not returning, I'm returning zero HTML. This is something that I'm gonna call. I'm gonna pass in a, um, excuse me, an access token. An access token that says, hey, I'm Javier. I need to send this data. Can you, I need to get this data. Can you get me back the data that I care about? Oh, sure, Javier, let me validate the token. Once the token's validated, I will send you whatever that is. If the token is invalid, then you get a, get a nice fat 401 unauthorized error message because none shall pass, okay? So what does that look like in configuration? So same thing as, an, uh, as the other applications, you know, Builder, we have the using that namespace. And literally, instead of, uh, saying that add authentication cookies, that add open ID connect, that add, that add, that add, we have a one-liner, classic Microsoft, right? <laughs> Where it says add Microsoft identity web API authentication. <sighs> that rolls off the tongue. So that's web API. If I were to go services that add Microsoft web app application that is for my mvc or controllers or html okay that configuration is all configured out here this is the client id for that application so let me come up for sorry for that api so let me come to lozano tech 
show 425 API. It's that AD, uh, ADBC, six blah, 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 whatever. ADBC, six blah, blah, blah. Literally the same values. The difference is here, I'm now telling it, hey, by the way, the application lives in this domain. The tenant ID is common. So remember I was talking about in the other endpoint that was slash, the other URL was uh, authority slash common. Well, the reason why that is, is because we have different things. We have, if I want to write, if I want to limit things to just a tenant to that specific Azure instance, I will give it then the ID of the directory, AKA this GUID. If I wanted something else, common organizations, common would be like, hey, use any organization plus Microsoft account. If I want to say just use Azure AD directories, so Contoso, Fabricant, whatever other bus thing that's out there, only use those that, that on MicrosoftOnline.com. If I only want to use Microsoft account, then you send it to consumers. So I can choose my own adventure. So by going with common, you let it gives you the breadth of using both, all of the directories and all of the personal accounts. So sort of a context there. All right, so that's been set up there. Um, now, one of the things that uh, once we show that there, so literally that just reads those values and plugs it in and just computes it, computes it by literally just setting values across. Um, and then down here, the one thing I did not show was this um, in the other one um, where we actually have to say we, this says I want you to add authentication. This says, by the way, I want you to enforce that authentication. And this, in my other example, where we're doing that um, from direct that uh, UG demo also had this had these two lines of code saying, use the authentication and use the authorization. Make sure that the user has access to these things and has the right set of claims for able to actually execute this. And then line 47 says, hey, by the way, for every single controller, every single endpoint that API is in here, and it's everything needs to be authenticated. So this thing is literally locked down to the to the most possible lockdown way. Right? So which is cool because essentially what it's doing behind the scenes, this method here, it's essentially saying, hey, I'm going to be looking for these tokens that are part of this authority. They're, they're sorry, that they're created by this authority, signed by the authority, and I'm going to be looking for them, these tokens in the authorization header as bearer tokens. Right, so it's an access token that gets sent via header. So it's not like nothing is the URI, nothing gets leaked, nothing gets thrown into a log or whatever else. It's just all publicly, it's all, it's all privately through the channel because it's part of the body that's set there. Now you're doing over this over your HTTP, it's going to get logged. HTTPS, it's not because it's a secure channel. Okay, so in here, uh, I can run the application, do whatever. There's really not much to show just because it's sort of plain Jane. But there's a different in, the difference in here for uh, this. If I, uh, since this is an API, I have to come in here and say, I need to expose an API. This essentially is, I am defining scopes, right? And a scope is to restrict access to data and functionality protected by the API. So this means that these tokens have to have the right value, the right, I can have multiple scopes and I can say, hey, by the way, Javier, I need you to get a scope for read and not write, or I need to get a scope for write but not read, or I need to get a scope for list only, so I can only view the list. But if I want to look at the individual item, I need a different scope of reading that individual item. So you can get down to that minutia if you want to, and you can define them all of them here. And here for this simplicity, I went through and I say, hey, we're having a demo. This is the name of the scope is demo.read. That's all it is. It's a very simple scope, which is like, hey, it could be demo.list, demo.write, whatever. It doesn't matter. But what essentially is saying here, here's the fully qualified name of this scope. It has to be a GUID, yet another GUID, uh, which is the same GUID as my application, my client ID, because Azure AD is keeping track of all of these scopes across every single application. So it needs to, right? It needs to be able to say, yep, it's right there. So this application says, hey, by the way, I provide these scopes. 
Um, so that way, uh, if someone wants to lock it down for specific things, I can do it that level. This is very important. Otherwise, you're just saying, hey, cool, the token's valid. Uh, do whatever you want. You can get down to another level of granularity by creating those scopes and actually adding that uh, um, those individual pieces there. So I just kind of wanted to show there that, hey, here's yet another way for protecting your application. All right, any questions? Before I go on to the next demo. Once, going twice, sold. All right, now this application, I decided to go a little, um, I was going to say a little old school, not old school, but a little bit different. Uh, SAML app can I be designed, of course, because I don't have the design there up. Um, so anyway, this is a uh, SAML application, a desktop application. It could be a WinForms application. It doesn't care. This application is the client. So what does that mean? This application is actually going to leverage Azure AD to authenticate and to set information about itself. How many of us have launched a desktop application and we get the little pop-up where it says log in with Gmail or log in with whatever, right? Our mobile applications do that all the time. Where you click log in, it, it can either flow to a different view and it's just like, oh, let me log in with Apple ID or let me log in with whatever, right? You can easily set that up that way. Well, in this situation, this application is actually going to be using Azure ID behind the scenes. Now, this is very, it's a lot more involved than a web app because it's a desktop app and it's got to do certain things certain, in a certain way, excuse me. So uh, what is those certain things? So in particular, if I were to show you, uh, the, it is using, remember we had Microsoft that identity, um, that web. This essentially is using Microsoft that identity, that client, that desktop, because there's a bunch of stuff in there that uh, that essentially this this NuGet package uses this NuGet package, and the reason why it's there is because this thing uh, will actually invoke a window, a pop-up window for the authentication to happen. So it needs to know about UI threats. It needs to how to host a web browser inside of it. There's none of that code in here. It's all being handled by these uh, NuGet packages, right? So it's kind of neat because you can actually configure it that way if you want to. Um, and, and again, the sky's the limit. You can go about it and configure everything else that you want. Now, the difference in here, what I will show you is that to kind of keep it simple is, or tie the two together, is that, look, I'm still going against a, I'm, in this one, I'm using a different situation. I'm sorry, a different pattern. I'm going login, Microsoft Online. I'm going specific version. So this essentially is what tenant type? Oh, I want you to use common. Okay. I want you to use all type of types. What's my client ID? 609, uh, uh, 6098. 6098, let's go look at Lozano Tech. Let's look at client, 6098, boom, one to one, okay? So I'm defining that there, here's my client. And by the way, uh, actually let me comment this guy out because this was a different demo that I can show you. Uh, I am requesting a specific scope. That is that scope we created in the other one, in the in the API. For say, hey, by the way, when I want when I log in and you give me a token, you're going to give me two tokens. By the way, you're going to give me an ID token, which is going to represent me, the application, and you're going to give me an access token, which represents me, the user, and what that user has access under that application or can do under that application. Then I can send that token throughout, and that token can then be validated against Azure AD. Okay, so if I come over here, um, if I click on API permissions, because this is a client, so this is consuming tokens, um, not essentially validating them. This is saying, hey, I need to get, when I request data, I want to create these sort of tokens. If I click on API permissions, you'll see the following. Let me come uh, do that. You'll see there's my API, 425 show, demo.read. And to add one, literally you click add permission. What would you like to access to? Would you like to ask the Microsoft app graphs? Would you like to get a token for Azure DevOps? Would you like to get a, a token for um, app service management? What kind of token does your application need to do? Literally, it's up to you. You can actually select them from here, right? Uh, do you? Um, 
Cosmos, Data Catalog, Data Lake, whatever, you know, OneNote, SharePoint. And these are specific to those applications, right? Not necessarily just across the board. It's like, here are the keys, don't scratch it. This is, you're very specifically of what kind of API permissions you're requesting to for this application, for that user. Okay. Uh, IPS, my application uses, here's a bunch of them out there that have been listed that you've been added. However, I went and said, yeah, I want, I registered an application. Remember on the 425 um, show API, we went and created that, when I created that scope, it says, oh yeah, you have an application that has, that's secured by Azure AD. Would you like to access that one? And I said, yes. And, oh, which scope would you like? Demo that read. That's where that comes from. Also, by default, when you create a client, a desktop client, you get, hey, user.read. Now you know where I got it from, uh, this demo.read. It essentially says, hey, you hack, you can read any type of user. Um, you can sign in and then use, use uh, uh, user profile, read it. You have access to that. So you can get information about the currently logged in user. That's about it. Now, I can add other permissions. Again, I can add Microsoft Graph. I can, if I want to add, if I want to, Select the graph, um, delegated permissions. I don't see, is there anything in here? Uh, so I want to be agreement, read all the terms of, if I want to have the ability to do that, I can. I mean, again, I can literally cherry pick and be very specific of the type of claims that are being sent. So what I'm saying here when on this application, in by using in line 22, I'm saying, hey, I want to create that token only with this claim. I don't want any more claims. Um, and we'll show you kind of how that works in here in a second. So um, when the application starts, there's going to be a button. There's going to be a window. It's going to say sign in button. What it's going to do, it's going to go and create a public, I create, a, this is a, a wrapper. So if I go in here and go to definition, this is a wrapper, a static object, because it needs to be static because it's an in memory of the application. This is about the only times that static objects or God objects are okay because it's an app, it's a desktop app. It's gonna be running in there until the user clicks it off, right? So you need to have that information in memory. So I'm reading the client ID, I'm reading the instance of the tenant, I'm reading the tenant, I'm formatting the authority, and I'm saying, hey, by the way, start creating this application builder with this metadata. Right, give me the scopes, give me the IP address, give me values, whatever they're there. So they're just wrappers for stuff that's already there. So what does that mean? It means that down here, I get the app scopes, I get the app. In other words, this is the instance of the client app with all the metadata of saying, you're gonna go against this tenant, against this Azure instance with this ID, blah, 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 blah. Then uh, you can, there's a drop down that it says, select how you want to sign in. Now, uh, we have something called WAM, Windows Account Manager. Where does Windows Account Manager live? If I come over here and I look at accounts, uh, there's, I love myself. That's why I have three pictures of myself. No, I have the same default account, <laughs> same picture for all three accounts. If I come out to and I click on access school or work, I can connect an account in here if I wanted to. Or if I click an email in accounts, here's the accounts that are associated with my Windows login. So this is Windows Account Manager. So I have my Gmail account and I have my other account, which are different Microsoft accounts. So what this allows me to do is it's like, hey, select the currently signed in account, right? You log into Windows. If you have a, if you hook up Windows and you say, I'm logging with Microsoft account, it's gonna pick the one that's currently logged in. Pretty straightforward. If it's not, then it's going to say, hey, choose your own adventure. From that list that's set up, you pick whichever account you want to use. Or you can say, hey, you know what? At this point, um, just do whatever. You know, whatever, list all the accounts and then let the user handle it from there. So you have a different way of, of handling this. And this is all part of that application object that you have available. Like it tells it, tells it how to do. Um, then we say, I want you to acquire that token silently. What does that mean? Here's my tokens, sorry, here's my scopes, here's the permissions that I care about, here's the account that I have. You know where you need to fall. You need to phone home. Bundle it up together, make an API call, give me back the, give me back the token. The moment I have the token, 
skip all these catches for different different scenarios. I want you to display that token and be able to enable different things in the application. Again, there's a lot of stuff in here that, that unfortunately I don't have enough time to cover, but let me show you how it all works as we get to here. As I'm waiting for these applications to start up, how many of you are, uh, I need to start the API as well, because otherwise it's not gonna work. How many of you have desktop applications that you have custom authentication with and just kind of wanted to know if if you're using that or if this is completely unnecessary <laughs> for for you. Going once. Uh, twice. Nope. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll Alec, you can you can let me know if someone pe peeps up and says and has that question. Um, really quick here, that localhost four four three six three slash identity. This is that AP. This is a four two five APO. I'm uh, sorry, API app. Notice that I got a 401. It means I am not authenticated. I cannot view this app because I didn't give it the right token. So it failed. It told me ah, none shall pass. This is what the, uh, the application looks like. Uh, the account is used to sign in, you know, the account used to sign into Windows, one of the uh, accounts known by Windows, or any user account. In other words, you type in whatever you want into that text box. So let's see what this guy looks like. I hit sign in. Da, 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 da. Sign into your account. Pretty cool, huh? I cannot go. You can't hear it, but it's like, I can't select that other window because I'm, I need to authenticate. And hey, we found an account you can use because you signed into it. It is part of your Windows. Would you like to use this account? Sure. YOLO. The moment I do that, Remember that was that saying, hey, let's get that token behind the scenes. Let's go and, and get that information. Great, here's the information that the token has. It has my name, my identifier, and where it actually authenticated from. If I were to select this value, and if I were to go to this URL, jwt.ms, jwt JSON Web Token, okay? Oh, come on. JSON Web Token is a, a format, actually it's an RFC, of self time tokens uh, using JavaScript. So uh, they're using Java, um, sorry, um, JSON object notation that essentially is composed like this. We have a header, we have a payload, and we have a signature. The signature is composed of the header and the body, the payload. So if I were to if I were to look at it, this is nothing more than a Base64 decoded uh, uh, encoded value. This is Base64 encoded. This essentially is Base64 encoded of a SHA-256 signature hash. So, but it's created by computing these two values. So, what does that mean? Even though it's 64 bit and uh, uh, 64 uh, base encoded, Base64 encoded. Excuse me. I can view it, but if I were to change it, the signature is invalid because the signature is signed and because the signature is hashed. So yeah, I could tamper with the token, but I, by tampering it, I already made it invalid. Pretty neat. So it's sort of a self, like a self-signed certificate. It gives you that value to the ability to be able to say, yep, hey, the information that's here is correct. It will always be there. Yeah, it's visible, but it can be mucked with. So at the same time, be careful what you put in these claims. I, if you're generating your own tokens and whatnot, but let's go look at it. The header says is the JGBT. It's the algorithm is 256. Here's the uh, the um, the uh, unique identifier um, for the actual tokens by actual signature that signed the token. Here's the version. Here's the issue with this. Here's the subject. Here's that unique ID. Here's the audience. That's the client. Remember when we said validate audience? That's where that same GUID comes from. Here's the expiration, where it was issued by, when it cannot be used by, the name, the username, different information about it. That's the I, uh, object, sorry, the, uh, the ID token. If I click on it here, you see the claims, this parses it. So this guy will expire on May 19th, which is today at uh, 255 uh, Columbia. So this is a GMT negative five. So I don't know what that is in uh, US, uh, can't even think, uh, um, central time. But anyway, so the thing I was going to show you here was this. If I go to the access token, 
the access token. Same thing, literally same structure, different data. The difference is in here now, this says, hey, by the way, your scope is demo.read. So there's other information in here. So you have the ability to use this scope. So when you call an API, the API will say, hey, by the way, here's the token that you have. So you can check, do you have the scope? My API doesn't do that. My API just says, hey, I just care about a signed token. Um, so why do I care about these things? And here, I can hit call API. Call API will actually call this token, will call this endpoint, and will get me data for it, and it will echo it back. So if I were to come in here and say call API, you'll see type, you'll see all of the results that essentially were echoed back by that API. If I were to copy this access token, come to, um, excuse me, Postman or another debugging tool, and I go against that same URL, if I pass in kitten as the token, I'm going to get a 401. You're not authorized to view this. If I pass in that token, that API is going to receive the token. And it's going to say, I need to phone my authority that I have settings and that, and I need to validate this token. Sweet, the token is valid. Perfect. Pass go. Now you can do whatever you need. And here's the data. I'm echoing back what's in here. The, experience, the expiration, the issued ad, the none before, so, so forth and so forth. It's pretty neat, right? Because now I've, I was able to authenticate with a desktop application to Azure AD, get that, get that information, request a token, and I can actually call up APIs that I can deploy in Azure or any cloud. It doesn't actually have to be in Azure. If I want to, I can deploy this in, um, in Google Cloud Platform. Sorry, Derek, I had to. That was the first cloud that came up to my mind outside of Azure. And I can still have that application deployed as an as in Docker container running there, but that application can still phone to Azure AD to say, hey, validate this token. Welcome to the new world. That's how awesome and open this things, these things can be. Really quick, uh, I was going to show you something here, is that I had another um, scope. Let me comment this out. Let me comment this back in. This is graph.microsoft.com uh, user read. So I actually want a scope for user read on the Microsoft graph. So remember, I had two scopes listed here, the demo read and the one. So I'm now requesting the demo I showed was just this, this permission. So if I were to pass this to the Microsoft graph, it will error out and says, you don't, you don't, what are you doing here? This token's invalid. Now I'm specifically requesting this token for the Microsoft Graph. However, uh, the way I have the code over here, give me two seconds, uh, window. I need to comment this guy out because this assumes that I'm calling the API, uh, the API that I just showed you. So I come over here and I log in. Da, 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 da. I want to sign in with a different account, uh, accounts known. I'll select that same Gmail. I have my access token for that Gmail. I can now come over here. Remember, I was able to pass this in here. 401 unauthorized. It's unauthorized because it's not a token for that API. It's a token for a different API. Even though I logged in the same app, it's a different token, different scopes. That's the beautiful of the granularity. It's a token for the graph.microsoft.com v1.0 slash me, get me data. I just paste it there. Actually, let me do uh, let me do this foo so you can see it in here. Send. Come on, error. App. Da, da, da. Invalid token authentication, compact token, blah blah blah. Here's gives you the full details of what actually happened. And here I can actually pass that token, hit send, and it says, "Yeah, here you go. Your Javier. Here's your Gmail. Here's all the information." I could also request a token that has both scopes in it if I wanted to. It's really up to you and your application needs. And that's it. I'm three minutes over time. My apologies. Uh, was this good? Good, bad, and different? I think it was good. I'll yeah. stop the recording and see if anybody has any questions. Yeah. <laughs>